There we go. Perfect. All right, so you've got your chat box there, so make sure you jump on, ask any questions, and we'll be answering them as we go along. So hi, everyone. My name is Sophie Mosumechi, and I am the co-founder of what is an amazing business called Real Entrepreneur Mums. So just really quickly, for those of you who don't know anything about Real Entrepreneur Mums, I'm going to share a little bit with you, um, and then we kick off. So this is my gorgeous co-founder, Alison Valenti. Um, who has got three children, Matthew, Mark, and Matthew, Mark, don't tell her I called her Mark, Matthew, Amelia, and Luke. Um, her background is in corporate training, mentoring, and she's been a leader in many different roles, especially in the insurance business. She's founded the Mums Business Kickstart as a business coach, which is how we met. And she believes that anything is possible. You can do she believes that you can be more, do more and have more. You just need to know the steps and that's what she teaches people, which is why her topic is so awesome. And Alison's crazy. She's gone from running 5Ks to training for a marathon, which I just think is incredible. So Alison's all about pushing yourselves outside your comfort zones and setting really big goals. And it actually doesn't matter if you achieve the goals. The fact is that you're going for it. And I think that's incredible and crazy at the same time, but that's why she runs and I don't. So a little bit about me. So I am uh, happily married most of the time to my hunky hubby, who I call him that and he absolutely hates it. Those of you who know him know that he hates that and that's why I love it even more. Uh, and he hates when he sees me have written it somewhere. I've got two delicious children, so Toby and Stella. Toby's six and Stella is nearly four. And I run a business called Leading Change, um, which is a change management consulting business, uh, consulting with IAG at the moment, which is really lots of fun. I'm loving working with them. Um, I specialise in corporate leadership and um, change, and I help them through transitions, through changes. I'm a farm girl, so I actually grew up in the country, had a pet pig called Gertrude, and uh, moved to the Gold Coast when I was 18, and kind of fell into um, entrepreneurship when my youngest, no, when Toby, um, I realised I went back full time into corporate and realised that he had more of our Polish nanny's mannerisms than he had of either mine or Daniel's. And I just went, holy, wow, okay, I need to find another way and started on my entrepreneurial journey. And that's when I met Alison and how it all got started. So I believe anything is possible. You just have to have the vision, the passion, and you have to take massive action because you need all three in order to get what you want. Um, so why listen to us? So um, I know many of you know about this already, but uh, you know we've grown a business in um, under 18 months to six figures. We've been featured in many, many publications. A few of them are on there. Um, we've been mentioned in Parliament um, several times. We launched our own Real Mag, which is, an, uh, which is a magazine for entrepreneur women. Um, and we were recently named, is it on the, oh, there it is, <laughs> top 50 small business leaders by Inside Small Business in Australia, which was just incredible. And we were on the front cover of the magazine, which is crazy. I've got a copy here. But um, absolutely blown away. And we're on the front cover of the magazine as well. So that's a little bit about who we are. And Real Entrepreneur Mums is a business referral group. We, our mission is to build a global business that inspires women to go after their dreams and smash their goals. And um, that's absolutely what we're doing with the support of our leadership team and our fabulous members all across Australia. So, so glad to have you on tonight. You can follow us on all of the different platforms if you want to check us out. We'd love to connect with you and learn more about your business. But let's get into it. That's enough about us. So tonight's topic is the seven deadly sins of an entrepreneur. Now, I have some bad news, though. Alison's unable to join us tonight. So sick kids, she's just desperate. She wanted to be here. And I said, honey, you just need to be where you need to be. But good news is you've got me and I have a special guest who's going to co-facilitate tonight with me. So Nicole Twerick, I probably said that wrong, and I'm going to unmute her so that she can... Um, so that she can tell me what I have done wrong. So let me just quickly find you. Where are you? Nicole, Nicole, Nicole. There you are. There she is. Hi, Nicole. How are you? I'm great. Do you want to take your video off for a minute so the girls can see who you are? Sure. Let me see if I can work that out. <laughs> I don't even have an option on this. Oh, maybe you don't. That's okay. Yeah, maybe because I'm a, a participant. Oh, 
there we go. Um, do you want to just introduce yourself a little bit so the girls know who you are? Absolutely. Um, so thank you very much for asking me to do this. Um, my name is Nick Twerk. I'm a um, mum to two beautiful girls and uh, I have my hubby Jeff and we live in Melbourne. So I have been in the consulting business for longer than I care to admit um, in a pub public forum really. Um, and also in the last 12 months I've started uh, working as a business coach, working, working with professional mums in small business. Um, so we moved down to Melbourne in September last year to be closer to family, which has been absolutely amazing. And I feel very, very lucky to have found real entrepreneur mums um, who have recently started down here with our Melbourne Central Group. So I'm also a community leader, um, which has been absolutely an incredible experience. I'm so enjoying getting to know all of the amazing ladies in our group. <laughs> Fantastic. And perfectly. <laughs> yes, yes. And um, Nicole is an incredible business coach. She runs online coaching sessions and one-on-one -on -one as well. So when I looked for who would be a great person to step in, it was definitely um, a quick call to Nicole and she was more than happy to help. So thank you so much, Nicole. I'm going to leave you unmuted so that we can, um, we can keep going. And uh, Alison does send her deepest condolences, but um, she'll be back on board really, really soon. But let's get cracking on her topic, which is the seven deadly sins of a small business. I love to call this of an entrepreneur. And I will put my hand up that I am, yep, I have probably done all seven of these things. And it'd be interesting to see. I'd love as we go through and we pull up each one, just put a little comment in the uh, chat box and let us know if this is something that you've probably uh, done in the past as well. So um, let's get cracking. So the seven deadly sins small businesses make in marketing that cost them money, customers and time. So sin number one, let's get started. Now, if you remember Real Entrepreneur Mums, you should definitely know all about this because we teach this straight off the bat. Sin number one is not defining their target audience. So when you are trying, like when I ask someone, okay, so who's your target audience? Who's your ideal customer? And they say, well, everyone, everyone, you know, buys skincare. Okay, well, no, that's, that's not true. That's not who your target audience. Your target audience, if you are looking to try and sell to everyone, what's gonna happen is that your message is going to get lost. If you think about how many different messages and images and videos are flashed in front of our eyes or in our ears in a day, it's in the thousands. And if your message isn't specifically talking to your ideal target audience, it's going to get lost. There is so much noise in there and you need to get cut through. So if you don't define who your target audience is, your message is gonna be bland and boring. So understanding your target audience and then you can speak directly to them. And I know when someone has done their work very well because when I see an ad or a post or something and it comes up and it makes me stop scrolling and I sit there and I read it and I'm like, wow, this is me. They have done their work on their target audience because they're talking my language. And that is how you identify what your target audience is. So think about, you know, what problems do they have? So you want to write them down. What are the problems they have? What keeps them awake at night? And then how can you put your messaging um, in front of them? Okay, so that's number one. We talk about defining your target audience as your Emma. So where does she hang out? Where does Emma hang out? How many kids has she got? Does she have kids? What stage of life is she in? Is it a she? Maybe it's a boy. Um, maybe it's older people or younger people. What platforms are they hanging out on? Um, you know, what do they like? What do they dislike? When you can create a really clear picture of who your ideal client is, you can then sell directly to them. It's really, really important. Okay, so Nicole, I'm going to hand over to you for sin number two. Great, thank you. So I would love for you to pop your hand up if you would say that you are in online business. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that a very high number of you would will put your hand up to say that because most of us are using... Um, online business in some way, shape or form to market ourselves. And most of us will have a website. And the biggest mistake that I see a lot of my clients making, and particularly early on in their business, is they're not capturing leads. So what this means is 
you might be getting traffic to your website or traffic to your social platforms. People might be following you on Instagram or Facebook, but what they're doing is they're exploring and they're really just sussing out whether you're actually someone they might want to get to know a little bit better or they might want to um, follow to learn from or whether or not indeed you're someone they actually might be willing to invest some of their own money in to have you help them solve a problem whether that's products or services what we see though is if you're not giving people an opportunity to connect with you in a more concrete way so capturing leads is about capturing generally their email address and their name into your email database so that you can market to them. So that can look like an opt-in, which would be a downloadable product of some sort or a free training that they give you, they give you your, their email address and uh, in return you send them an email with a link to something that they can download. It might be a great cheat sheet or a roadmap to get to a particular outcome that's of interest to them or free training. And then you've got their email address in your list. And that means that you can connect with them and build that know, like and trust factor by delivering value over time. So the best way to do this is to come up with a simple way to respond to a need that they're going to have that they are going to want more information on. That's essentially what it is. And it can be really intimidating because it can feel like this really complex thing and people talk about email funnels and all sorts of stuff that comes after that. Don't worry about that. You just need to have a mechanism to capture their information uh, so that when they decide to go away from your platform it doesn't matter if they forget what your name is or what your link was or how to get back there again because you've got their details and you can continue to talk to them and sell to them perfect oh good okay so number three where are we i couldn't get that mouse to work number three the sin number three is having all of their marketing eggs in one basket now there are a lot of different platforms and channels out there. Like I will be the first person to admit that when you're starting out, it is overwhelming. So by knowing who your target audience is and where they hang out, you can then start to narrow it down into a key couple. So I would recommend starting off with maybe two different platforms. And then as you nail those, then you can start to branch out and start to nail others. So you need to be on lots of different platforms. And the reason is because you think about your own purchasing habits or your own research habits. The first thing we do is we jump into Google or we jump into Facebook and we type them in. And we want to be able to see they come back with, a, you know, depending on the type of business, a LinkedIn profile, um, a Facebook page, a website. And these are all things that are helping us to make the decision around, you know, are they really good <laughs> for first? That's the first thing you want to see. How's their present? Is it consistency? Is it consistent across all the platforms? Do you think that they're good? Have they got good testimonials and stuff up there? Um, and then, you know, you think you've got Facebook, you've got Instagram, you've got YouTube, LinkedIn, there's Google, and that's just the online ones. So you've got social media, website, as Nicole was talking about, email as well. But then you've also got your offline. So this is your networking, you know, like a group like Real Entrepreneur Mums. You've got word of mouth. You've got guest speaking as well. That's another form of marketing, growing your brand. And then you've got PR. So getting yourself or your product or your service into, you know, publications, magazines, newspapers, on the radio, on the TV, podcast shows, things like that. So don't just invest all your time in one platform or one channel branch out do a couple of social medias pick a couple of different magazines or publications to pitch to and spread your message out wider and then get them all linking together so that from you know your facebook page they can register for your email database or from your website they can join a webinar so you can get them all talking together as well so don't put everything in the one basket because you never know actually what will happen with some platforms. They change the rules, like Facebook's always changing their algorithms and if you have everything in Facebook, then um, while, while you're trying to figure out what their algorithm change is or you're you know, updating things, 
If you don't have another platform that's operating at the same time, you can act, you can have a bit of a lull in your business. So that will also help with um, spreading that out too. So that's sin number three. So don't have all your eggs, marketing eggs in the one basket. So sin number four, trying to be like everyone else. How boring would that be, Nicole? Oh my goodness. It is so easy, <coughs> excuse me, to be intimidated by all the people that are out there and just watching everyone else's business when really all you need to do is be yourself. And that's what this sin is all about. Because if it's similar to being, you know, just on one platform and not being able to make enough um, impact so that people actually notice you. If you're, if you look and sound like everybody else in your niche and everybody else who provides the products and services that you provide, then how on earth are you going to stand out to your Emma when she comes looking for you? So what this is all about is what is it that's different about you? I bet if you were talking to your best friend and telling them about your business and they asked you a question about a competitor, you would have a really strong opinion that you would be really comfortable in telling them about what is different about you. It might be the way you provide your service. It might be a different perspective that you take on how you help people with the particular problem. Um, it might be the, if, you, if you're selling products, it might be that your products are organic. It might be that they're handmade. It might be that they're really, really cost effective. There's, there are things about you and your business that are very different to all of your competitors. And it's really, really important to embrace those things that, that are different. And I think, for particularly mums, and I probably say this because mums are my niche as well, we, I don't think we can be in small business without being really, really connected to our business because it's a part of us. It's one of our babies. It's usually a really important part of where we want to get to and what we're working towards. And so I think that bringing your own personality into your business is a great way for you to start to rise up out of all that noise that's going on in your niche and for your Emma when she's trying to find you. Because being yourself, we naturally connect with people who are really natural and you can tell that it's not contrived. You can tell that you just want to connect with them. And, and we've all, well, I hope everybody else has experienced this, <laughs> but we've all kind of, you know, found these people online where you're like, oh, I just really want her to notice me because I think she's really, really lovely or, or whatever that might be. So for me, this is about, being yourself, knowing what's different about the way that you do things in your business better than other people, whether that's your products, your services, how you deliver, it might be your back end, you might be super efficient, whatever it is that's different about you. But the other thing is that making the thing about you and your business that is different speak directly to your Emma. So it plays back to that first point. The better you know your customer avatar, the better you know who that ideal person is that you want to work with and what they love and what they don't like and their hopes and their fears and the problem that you're solving for them and, you know, their gender and have they come from the country and do they have kids and just giving them this personality, it helps you to really rise up when you are being different and, and speaking about your different differentiation, I guess, is the right word to be using here um, to make it really about your ideal client. So for me, I think this is, this is, it's really just about being yourself and being really, really authentic and don't be intimidated by everybody else that's out there because I guarantee you that they are a red hot mess behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Except for you guys, of course. <laughs> <Absolutely> not. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true and that's like the word real in real entrepreneur mums you know people are looking for perfection they're looking for real they're looking for relatability and your story and your uniqueness is what is going to connect your Emma with you because you're not for everyone not everyone's going to love real entrepreneur mums I know I had to <laughs> I had to realize that and that's okay because we're not for everyone um, but yeah, get, get comfortable with who you are because when you do, God, it makes things easier. So much different. That was great, Nicole. Thank you. So sin number five, f 
focus on themselves and not the customer. Now, I've got a few different stories kind of flooding into me and um, one that I remember particularly is one of our members and she had a great product, um, but it was built all around what she thought was good and she delivered it in a way that she thought her customers wanted because that's what she wanted. But when we got to know her and we were all like, oh, but I wouldn't do it like that. And I, you know, I hope she doesn't mind. I'm going to, uh, to talk about her for her service. But she does home workouts in nine minutes, right? Which sounds fabulous. But you had to know workouts in nine minutes. But you had to go to a gym and use gym equipment. And we're like, well, I don't go to a gym because I've got little kids at home. And, you know, can we use stuff around the house? And she's like, no, you have to use this specific stuff. Or you have to go buy it. But after she listened to us, <laughs> um, and took down that resistance around, well, no, this is what I think it should be because I know better because I'm the expert. Um, once she listened to what her customers were telling her, she was able to make those little tweaks. And now when she engages with her customers, she's talking and delivering it in ways that suits them. And then they're going, oh, like her Emma is going, oh, that's exactly what I need. Oh, it's perfect. It's fit for me. I can do this at home. I can, you know, do it before I, you know, pick the kids up from school or whatever it is. So, you know, just because you think your product is great doesn't mean everyone else will. Now think about that for a minute. That's huge. How many times have you come up with an idea and you're like, oh, my God, this is going to be amazing? And then you're like, oh, who's going to buy it? Everyone will buy it. Well, but will they really? And that's where we keep talking about really define who your Emma is. If you know what your Emma, her problems are, and then come up with a solution for her problems, then, bam, you've got a winner. And I can think of, I think Tony's on here, so I might bring up Tony's story. So I remember Tony... Um, you would tell it way better than I, Tony, but um, Tony was absolutely sick of mismatched lids in her um, container drawer, right? So how many of you have one of those drawers that is just a nightmare? So, you know, she's like, oh, my God, if I can't find this lid, these lids one more time and her drawer was a mess, she was losing the plot. So she jumped online and started researching options, right? And she came across Mr. Lids, but it wasn't available in Australia, so she researched a bit further and she's like, well, if I'm having these issues, surely I'm not the only person. And clearly she wasn't. She did her research and then um, she looked into bringing out, be kind, Tony, of course I'll be kind. Um, and then she, you know, <laughs> brought Mr. Lids to Australia and now she owns Mr. Lids in Australia. So, you know, attached container lids, no more finding your lids, they stack in themselves. Um, you know, tidy, you use less space in your drawers. So she solved the problem of that she had for herself. So it makes it easier then when she's actually engaging and trying to sell her product because she knows exactly who her Emma is. Her Emma is herself. So it was much easier because she wasn't, I've got that right, didn't I, Tony? Yeah, the focus on, so she was focusing on the customer instead of on, on just her. So think about what the benefits are and what results your customer will get out of it. Um, a great way to do this is through testimonials. It's always so much easier to have someone else rave about how great your business is. And that's one of the reasons with Real Entrepreneur Moms, we talk about raving fans. If you can get your customers raving about you, video testimonials, reviews on your Facebook page, on your website, don't, you know, make, make sure they're linked to your website as well. It adds social proof and people want to buy from you. And if you get them showing how they've used the service or the product as well, rather than just how great you are, then that is a really great way um, for them to talk directly to your um, customers as well. And don't be shy to ask for feedback. I think we are so caught up with being perfect, right? This world of, you know, the Instagram filters, oh, my God, we've got to be perfect. You don't. And you should ask for feedback, especially in those early years. Tweak your messaging, tweak your product and your service, tweak how you're delivering it and keep asking for feedback until you know you've got it, you know, the 80-20 80, 80, 80, 20 rule. Get it right and ask for feedback. Maybe, you know, give away, you know, 10 free services and the only catch is that you, um, they do a proper feedback session with you so that you can really learn. And don't be defensive on the feedback. We, Alice and I always talk about, this is our test and learn years. Everything we're doing, we're testing and learning, we're trialing it, we're tweaking it, we're getting feedback, we're making it better every time. 
is the first time I ran, ran this webinar by myself tonight. No, nope, I've never run the webinar by myself. I couldn't figure out how to do the share screen. But you know what, the next time it will be better. Don't worry about perfection, just keep improving and keep the customer in the focus. What do they need? One of the questions that Alice and I always ask ourselves is how can we improve the experience for our customers? And our customers are our members. So keep the customer at the heart of all that you do. Um, and you cannot go wrong. Over to you, Nicole, for number six. Oh, we're powering through these. Yeah. And I have to say, you're doing a fabulous job. You, would ne you, you, you shouldn't have told us. We would never have known. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, sometimes Alice and I, we could step in for each other and without a picture, we sometimes talk the same as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sign of how closely you work together. Yeah. All right, sin number six, not having the wow factor in customers' experience. One of the things that always amazes me, and so my background before I started consulting was actually in customer experience. Um, and it's so easy, so easy to create an amazing experience for a customer. And usually it's free. And so this is, this is something that we can be doing right from the start when we don't have a heap of time, there are just a few things that you can do along the way um, in terms of understanding how your customer moves through your business to create this massive wow factor. So, so what do I mean by wow factor? You might have heard, if you've heard any training around customer experience and customer satisfaction, and you hear companies talk about um, wanting to delight their customers and wanting to build relationships with their customers or to make the experience of um, working with you be really easy and effortless. And so you can hear the sorts of descriptive words that come into it. One of the things that um, is really important in this space is for you to understand what wow looks like for your Emma. So is Emma looking for a really easy experience? Does Emma actually want it to be really quite hands-on? Uh, depending on what it is that you're doing, they might need you know, love and care through the um, journey of working with you. And so it means that you need to understand what that journey is of how Emma moves through your business. What are all of the touch points that she has as she moves through? So she sees your website, she might be following you on Facebook, she might join your Facebook group, she might be in your email list. And so you have all these different opportunities to wow her visually and capture her interest through the way that you're presenting things visually with your brand. So brand consistency. Then when she goes onto a different platform, she's seeing the same colors and the same type of images she's hearing your voice she might be getting the opportunity to to watch free training or something like that within your group and that's wowing her because she's learning and she hasn't paid anything yet uh, she might be on your email list and you might be really good at regularly sending out some valuable content to your email list and so you're warming her up and you're building this know like and trust factor and each time she interacts with you and your business there's this little element of wow, you know, that's really, it's visually exciting. It's consistent. She delivers value to me. She knows what she's talking about. I feel like she wants to help me. And then when Emma actually starts to engage with you and purchase something from you, that's all just the warm up to get to that point. How you actually engage with her through that experience of, um, making connection with you, learning about your product, making a purchase decision. If you're providing a service, it would be how you walk her through that service and, and, and the way that you interact with her and the way that you go above and beyond. Just that little bit. It doesn't have to be excessive in terms of what you do to exceed her, her expectations. I think about I booked a facial at the Jalik concept store in Brisbane and um, they have a lovely little room and you go in there and they set you up, but it's just the little touches. So there was somewhere for me to fold my clothes and put them down. And before I got onto the um, treatment bed, she soaked my hands and put some moisturiser on them. And then when I'm laying on the treatment bed, instead of just having a towel over 
uh, me, they knew that it was cold. And so they actually had a quilt that laid over you, which had, and there were all these little tiny things, which didn't take any extra effort, where I just felt completely relaxed and pampered much more than, so I remember those details way more than I remember the actual facial. It's things like that, anticipating those sorts of needs. Um, and I think that as you kind of build that relationship through the way that your Emma interacts with you. So taking the time, if it's a one-on-one -on -one service, to know something about them. If you see them, so for example, I'm a coach, I often see my clients more than once, so I try and remember things about them, their children, what have they been doing? I can ask them questions and treat them like the person that they are. And I think there's so much value in, in acknowledging all of those little pieces along the way. The other thing I wanted to say, though, is when something goes wrong, that that actually can be an opportunity for you to knock it out of the ballpark in terms of how Emma's feeling about you and your business. And if you can think about an example where uh, you've you've had a product or service and something hasn't gone right and the business has just gone out of their way to fix it for you. They've been apologetic. There's been no defensiveness. They've just gone ahead and resolved it. And you walk away, not even really remembering that stuff went wrong because they've done such a great job of dealing with it. And so that's why that's where, you know, thinking about this wow factor can be really important because it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether things are going well or not well, you just being really considerate around the experience that your customer has as they work with you uh, can create the wow factor irrespective of what's going on. I could not have agreed with you more. <laughs> Customer <laughs> experience is so close to my heart. It's actually one of the, um, the main topics of our Accelerate Summit this year. So every year our members are invited to a summit and this year the theme is all about accelerating your business by transforming your customer's experience. So it is just so important. Like every people always say, oh, I want more sales. I want more customers. But it's all about how they experience your business at every single step of the journey. I cannot wait for the summer because we're going to absolutely transform everyone's business by mapping out the um, journey points and then just absolutely tailoring it to their customer, to their Emma, so that they love them, are coming back and raving about them as well. Thank you, Nicole, that was brilliant. And the last sin, sin number seven, is too many ho hoops to jump through. Now, I can remember <laughs> how many times I've gone to buy something online and I get to that point where it says, please enter your credit card details, and I go, oh, shit, I don't have my wallet with me. Like, I don't, do you know what I mean? There's no click through to kind of connect with a program or to or put my credit card details automatically in. And I'm like, oh, and I close it and I go, I'll do that later. And I forget. How many times is that happening in your business? Something like that. Do you know where your customers are dropping off? Because that is a really good telltale sign that something's not working. You're making it too hard for them. It needs to be easy, effortless, fast to do business with you. Take the pain out. Take the, the, the additional steps that aren't required. So um, what I want you to do is have a look at the process. So when I say process, I mean step by step that your customer goes through right from the first time. Maybe it's the, the first time they search for, you know, containers. <laughs> I didn't want to put a name in there, <laughs> but maybe they're searching for containers or, uh, you know, maybe they're searching for skincare or whatever. How do they find you? Um, but once they land on your website, what are the steps? How many pages, how many clicks do they have to do to get through, to buy, to check out, to get the receipt? What are all those steps? Now, you might have mapped this out at the very beginning, but I bet you your processes have changed since you first started. Map it out again. And then sit through and go through that process yourself and put yourself in their shoes. Buy something from your website if you're an online business. Or, you know, book in an appointment if you're um, a, more of a consulting kind of business. Go through the process that your customer goes through so that you can see how annoying it is in their view and what you need to fix. I'm all about automation. Uh, that, that's my, like, if anyone wants to know what my word is for the year, it's automation. <coughs> 
Last year was simplified, this year's automate. <laughs> so what can you automate? What can you just make, you know, even, you know, pre-populating fields um, is really important. Like my credit card, so many people have not had money from me because that annoys me. So what are those things? How can you make it simple for your customers? So um, doing this, if you do this, you will be able to increase, or sorry, decrease your drop-off rate. So I'd be interested to see how many of you actually know what that is. Um, is there an automated way that you can track it? Um, if you're doing online shopping, I'm guessing that there is. But even think about um, registering for an event. So maybe you do Facebook ads or you have a campaign that runs for people to um, register for an event. How many fields are you, and this is a learning I had to go through, how many fields are you asking people for to register for that event? Do you want to know everything about them? What information do you actually really need to know? Their name, their email address, maybe a mobile number. Um, trying to get too much information from them, mandatory fields, they'll just drop off. You don't want that drop off rate. Because even if they don't show up to your event, you'll still have their email address, like Nicole was saying, and then you can still keep building that relationship with them, building that trust with them. So find out what your drop-off points are if you can. Do a customer survey as well. Like you find out what their pain points are. Like I said before, don't be afraid to ask for feedback, especially in the beginning. You want to nail this. You don't want to go another, you know, three months, six months, a year, and you're still not seeing the return that you were expecting because you haven't nailed the processes. So this is what underlines, underlies your business. This is one of the core foundations of starting a business is having really simple processes. Make it easy for customers to do business with you. So at the, at the end, not only are they ridiculously happy with the product or service that you've given them, but they're like, oh man, that was easy. I can't wait to do that again, right? So think about how you can simplify that process for them. Okay, so lastly, I'm going to recap over the last, over the seven sins. So sin number one, not define your target audience. Sin number two, not capturing leads. Sin number three, having all your marketing eggs in the one basket. Number four, trying to be like everyone else. How boring. How boring. Just be like you. You are great just as you are. And sin number five, focusing on themselves and not the customer. It's all about the customer. Make your business customer-centric and see it go through the roof. Number six, <laughs> sin number six, not having the wow factor in customer experience. And the final one, sin number seven, which we just touched on, too many hoops to jump through. Keep it simple, keep it easy. Massive, massive thank you to my co-host, Nicole, who did an absolute brilliant, brilliant job tonight. Does anyone have any uh, questions quickly they want to jump in the chat box? Please let us know if you do. You are most welcome, everyone. And um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to connect with myself and Nicole on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you like. Jump into the Real Entrepreneur Mums Facebook group. We'd love to hear your thoughts from tonight. Maybe you could put, maybe you could do a testimonial in there for us. That would be great. See, you leading from the front. Ask your clients for their testimonial. So jump onto the Real Entrepreneur Mums Facebook group. Invite all your friends on there as well. And we look forward to seeing you on the next real um, insight session which is in two weeks with special guest trainer Susie Jacobs. Um, I can't wait to share with you all about Susie's story. She is an absolute rocker entrepreneur. She's talked on stage in front of thousands of people. She was the founder of um, Business in Heels and um, yeah, she's just absolutely incredible. And she's going to be sharing her story and all about how to get your confidence for, for the stage. So look out for that one. It'll be coming out in your inbox and also on, um, on our social media tag. So again, thank you so much to Nicole. And thank you everyone for joining us live. And for those watching the replay, we uh, look forward to seeing you on the next one. Bye for now. Thanks, Sophie.